On June 26, 2010, a young woman with red hair sat down at a table in a coffee shop in New York City, across from a man she had never met. The woman, a Russian spy named Anna Chapman, reached into her bag, removed a laptop and power cable, and handed them over to the stranger posing as a Russian consular officer, who introduced himself as Roman. But Roman, as it would turn out, was an undercover FBI agent, and their entire meeting was captured on video by a hidden camera in a sting codenamed Operation Ghost Stories. The meeting was one of many documented in the secret surveillance program that would uncover a sleeper cell of ten agents charged with, quote, carrying out long-term, deep-cover assignments in the United States on behalf of the Russian Federation. It was the stuff of spy legends. Using stolen American identities, the suspects had managed to blend into the U.S., start families who had no idea of secret lives, and establish the appearance of being normal, law-abiding citizens. Chapman, whose given name is Anya Khrushchenko, had been working for years as an undercover spy to Russia, both in the U.S. and the United Kingdom. She had married and divorced Alex Chapman, the son of a wealthy British executive while living in London, and kept his name. She was now meeting her handlers in New York once a week at different retail stores and coffee shops to share intelligence. But Chapman made technical slip-ups in her interactions with those handlers, such as using the same media access control address when communicating over private networks, which allowed the FBI onto her trail. The agency tracked her movements and her communications with her superiors, and were eventually able to fool Chapman into taking the fake meeting with the agent posing as Roman. Roman also gave her a fake U.S. passport that day, and instructed her to deliver it to another sleeper agent face to face. This request gave Chapman pause. She'd never been asked to meet anyone face to face, and had not done so up to that point, even with her handlers. She grew fearful of a setup, and bought a new cell phone along with two prepaid cards using a false name and address. But the FBI was watching this too, and an agent dug the receipt she had thrown out from the trash can to use as further evidence against her. She was arrested the next day, June 27, 2010. She stayed a short stint in U.S. jail before being deported back to Russia. Chapman was just one of ten Russian sleeper agents who were apprehended by the FBI that very same day. It was a massive sweep of agents sent to the United States under non-official cover to pose as American citizens and infiltrate and make contacts within the highest levels of American politics, industry, and academia to gain intelligence. Though three additional suspects were able to flee the country before being apprehended, the arrest of the ten agents found was a huge moral victory for the FBI, the culmination of a years-long investigation called Operation Ghost Stories. Operation Ghost Stories attempted to identify and investigate possible sleeper agents in deep cover in the United States. The case was later referred to as the Illegals Program by the Department of Justice in court documents. Some of the spies, like Chapman, modified an existing name, while others operated under pseudonyms or took the names of people who had died years earlier. Some of them operated as couples, men and women paired together in Russia or Canada to maintain the guise of a happy American family. Many of these couples even had children, like Andrei Bezrykov and Yelena Vavilova. Andrei Bezrykov and Yelena Vavilova were both Russian citizens who had been paired together and placed in a home in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They were posing as Donald Heathfield and Tracy Lee Ann Foley. Heathfield, a.k.a. Bezrykov, received his MPA from Harvard, claiming to be the son of a Canadian diplomat. He was working at the World Future Society, a think tank for future technologies that allowed him FaceTime with top global scientists and various political figures. The couple had two sons, Alexander and Timothy, ages 16 and 20, both of whom denied any knowledge of or involvement in their parents' covert activities once they had been arrested. However, in 2012, it was reported that Beruskov and Vavilova had in fact been grooming their older son Timothy in espionage techniques, which indicates he was in fact aware of their positions. Both sons traveled to Russia in July 2010 to visit their parents, who had been deported. They were denied re-entry to the U.S. and have been living in Moscow. Children who were minors at the time of the arrests and born in the United States were allowed to choose whether to stay in Russia with their deported parents or remain U.S. citizens. This was the case with the 9- and 11-year-old daughters of Vladimir and Lydia Guriev, who had been living in New York and posing as Richard and Cynthia Murphy. They had been tasked with obtaining information on U.S. policy in Afghanistan and Iran's nuclear program, but only Cynthia had managed to make any relevant contacts. 
building a Rolodex of New York financiers with ties to the global gold market. Another sleeper couple, Mikhail Vasenkov and Vicky Palayas, were living in Yonkers, New York, when they were both arrested on June 27th on charges of conspiracy to act as an agent to a foreign government. Vasenkov had been using the alias Juan Lazaro, the name of a child who had died in Uruguay at the age of three. Vasenkov and his handlers had used the social security number and the birth certificate, as many sleeper agents did, to build a new persona to operate under. He and Palayas, a Peruvian-born journalist who was also a U.S. citizen, were married in 1983. Both were passionate about the revolutionary politics being exhibited in many Latin American uprisings. Vasenkov even taught a class on Latin American politics at Baruch College in New York for one semester, but was let go after making disparaging remarks about the United States and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan in class. After the arrests of June 27th, the FBI went to work organizing a deal with the Russian government to release the 10 agents in exchange for four individuals who had been working for the CIA or MI6, who at the time were being held in Russian prisons. One of the four individuals was Igor Sutyagin, an arms control researcher who was held for 15 years in a labor camp on allegations that he had shared classified information on Russian nuclear submarines and missile systems with British intelligence. The swap took place on July 9th, when all 10 spies caught in the sleeper ring in the U.S. were deported to Vienna, where they were met and picked up by a Russian jet. How did the FBI arrive at a point where they were able to coordinate and execute the arrest of 10 different sleeper agents in different corners of the country on the same day? While the spies were, by and large, extremely careful about the equipment and techniques they used while in the field, it was often technical slip-ups, like Anna Chapman using the same MAC address, that opened the window for the FBI to hunt them down. Many of the spies used stenography software to hide or embed messages in otherwise ordinary image files. This was a smart additional layer of security, but only one properly executed from start to finish. Richard Murphy, aka Vladimir Guriev, had set a 27-character long password for his stenography software and left it sitting out, unencrypted, on a sheet of paper near his laptop, which agents found when they broke into his residence for a covert search. Another tape of security footage released by the FBI shows Christopher Metzos, another sleeper agent in the ring, picking up a shopping bag full of money from another spy. Metzos then drives to Wurtsboro, New York, where he buries the bag in a large wooded park. The FBI was able to track Metzos because they had picked up his car and placed a GPS tracker on it days earlier, allowing them to follow him to the pickup, document it, then follow him to the park in Wurtsboro, where Metzos stopped to bury the cash in what's called a dead drop. The FBI staked out the drop spot, planting cameras on the area. Two years later, a man and a woman arrived to dig up the package, were captured on camera, and subsequently marked by the agency for arrest. They were Mikhail Kutsik and Natalia Pereverzeva, another two members of the ten spies eventually detained as a part of Operation Ghost Stories. They'd been living in a high-rise apartment in Seattle for two years, where they received transmissions directly from handlers and posing as Michael Zadeli and Patricia Mills. When the FBI eventually broke into their home, they found notebooks filled with random numbers used to decode the radiograms they received. These type of mistakes point to a program that perhaps relied on its agents too heavily to be flawless when operating against titanically well-equipped and well-trained goliaths like the FBI. The FBI itself claims that no tradecraft or government secrets of any kind were successfully extracted by any of the ten spies arrested and deported in the illegals program. Though the agency's press release on the matter cites one agent who claimed the following, quote, Without us there to stop them, given enough time, they would have eventually become successful. Back on Russian soil, the fault for exposing the busted spy ring was placed on one man. On November 16, 2010, Russian newspaper Kommersant reported that there was a mole involved on the Russian side, working secretly for the CIA. The name they gave was Colonel Alexander Poteyev, the former deputy head of Department S, the branch of the Russian government behind the program. Moscow claimed that Poteyev had been working for the CIA since 1999, the entire time he was with Department S. He was tried in 2011 for treason, though by that time he had not been in Russia for years. At the trial, it was asserted that Poteyev was a 59-year-old Soviet-Afghan war veteran who had taken many short trips over the years to the U.S., Mexico, and other Western countries. They claimed that Poteyev had purchased a ticket to Minsk for June 24, 2010, and had then crossed over into the Ukraine using his brother's passport only three days before the spy ring was exposed by the FBI. 
Poteyev was a convenient scapegoat, as it absolved the Russian spies and their superiors from accusations that they had bungled the operation themselves. But there was little to nothing known about him, nor did any investigations into his whereabouts materialize. For years, Poteyev was never successfully tracked down by any media or known government source. Then, on July 7, 2016, Russian news agency Interfax reported that Poteyev had died in the United States and warned that one of their sources claimed the story could be illegitimate, an attempt by the Russians at having the Poteyev issue buried permanently. This raised many more intriguing questions than it answered. Most pressingly, was Poteyev ever a real person to begin with? If he was, what was his role in exposing the 2010 spiring? Oleg Kalugin, the former head of the KGB's operations in the U.S., insists that Poteyev would have been close to immune on American soil. No confirmation on the Interfax story has ever surfaced. It seems, for now, we are left in the dark. <laughs>